look, I had a bit of a technical issue right before class started and we PowerPoint stopped working. So hopefully we'll get through this without um, any issues. So last time I was answering some questions that people had about uh, about different aspects of, of um, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID. So I wanna get through those answers. Um, and then we're gonna be talking about a little more review information in terms of what this pandemic has done within our society. Um, is this, is it looking right? Is it my slides? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, and then um, we're also gonna talk about the communication assignment. I am determined to get through this uh, PowerPoint today, unlike every other day, so that there are no slides left behind. So hopefully we will finish on time or maybe even early. Okay, so one of the questions that was asked before um, was a little more information about SARS, um, how big of a deal was SARS? And some of you pointed out you know, that you weren't alive and don't remember what that was like. So I wanted to give you a little bit more information about the SARS outbreak of 2003. And I think that this, um, this uh, figure that Ali el had provided to us during his lecture is really useful. It's comparing the flu, COVID-19, that SARS um, outbreak in 2003, and MERS. And um, it goes through different issues with the um, these different illnesses. Uh, and, and then um, you can kind of compare across them. So one thing that I've already mentioned previously in this class is that if you look at the fatality rate across these different diseases, um, there are a lot of people who get SARS-CoV-2 and do not have serious illness or do not die. And so we actually have a decently good number when we compare it to the other serious coronaviruses, right? Many of the coronaviruses are not serious, but compared to the SARS-CoV-1 and um, MERS, they are, the, our numbers for COVID, our fatality numbers are actually better. Uh, so if this pandemic had been something that was deadlier, we could see even worse numbers than what we are already seeing um, in terms of fatalities. But looking down here, it shows you how many were infected in 2003 um, and then for MERS in 2014. Uh, and so you can see that it's a, it's a much smaller outbreak than what happened this time around. Um, and in fact, in addition to those numbers about uh, how many people were infected, um, 774 people died um, during the SARS outbreak in 2003. Some other people also asked, how does this compare to something like Zika virus or Ebola? How transmissible um, is COVID-19 compared to Zika, Ebola or, uh, Zika virus or Ebola? And that's actually a, a great question because um, it, it allows us to think about the different ways that diseases are transmitted. So with Zika virus, it's a vector-borne disease, right? That means that some intermediary animal is transmitting the disease um, between individuals. So for Zika virus, similar to malaria, it's a mosquito. So you have mosquitoes that are transmitting Zika virus between individuals. With Ebola, it's um, either contact with blood or other bodily fluids. With COVID-19, it's a respiratory virus, right? So it's it's respiratory particles. So those are three totally different ways to transmit diseases. And it makes it hard to compare um, how transmissible they are to each other because you're actually talking about different types of transmission, not just different rates within the same type of transmission. And you know, these different types of transmission are, are, are important because we there are so many different ways that we can end up having emerging infectious diseases. Um, some of you asked if I, th I thought SARS-CoV-2 was created in a lab. I definitely do not think that it was created in a lab. And I, my concern, especially about this idea, which obviously became very um, prominent at, at certain points during the pandemic, is that it undermines the fact that we are seeing increasing emerging infectious diseases 
because of the way we interact with the environment. And I think by trying to make it out like this was some sort of lab mistake or you know, an intentional outbreak, that sort of thing, we're actually undermining understanding the real causes of these illnesses. There were several questions related to uh, zoonoses, so I want to go through some of those. People asked, are, certain animal, are there certain animals to avoid to reduce zoonotic transmission? You know, um, this is a complicated question because obviously, as you've seen, bats um, have been implicated in several outbreaks. Uh, but, you know, we also get infectious diseases from domesticated animals especially when we look at farms. Um, and so it's not, a, it's not an issue of which animals we need to be concerned with. It's more about the way we interact with those animals and with the environment around us. So we wanna try and reduce possible transmissions between other animals and humans um, in the way that we're interacting with animals. Some of you asked how these transmission events happen between non-human animals and humans. Uh, could it be a bite? Certainly it could be a bite. That's one way that people get rabies. So rabies is, a, is another disease that we can get from animals. Um, and you can get bit by an animal and get rabies that way. However, as I pointed out with Zika virus, you can also have a vector. Um, one of the, the big pandemics that you hear about in history is the plague, the bubonic plague. Uh, and, and that was transmitted by a flea. So you had mice that um, then would get bitten by fleas. The fleas would then bite people. And so you had another vector-borne disease. Um, you can, you know, in situations when people are, are butchering animals and it's, a, a, you know, not a very safe environment, if they're bleeding and the animal is bleeding, that blood-to-blood -blood contact can lead to um, transmission of diseases. So there's, there's a lot of different ways that we can transmit diseases between, that we have the transmission of diseases between different species. But I think, you know, um, in terms of trying to reduce zoonotic transmission, one of the best things that we can do is have healthy interactions with the rest of the world, right? Um, that's that idea of one health where our health is depending on the health of domesticated animals, wild animals, and the environment. So the best thing we can do is try and make sure that we're having healthy interactions and taking care of not just ourselves, but the planet. Um, okay, so then someone else asked, is climate change a concern? Absolutely. And all of these topics, zoonotic disease transmission, um, climate change, the way we're interacting with the world, You'll see on the syllabus that there are several days in which we're going to be talking about these sorts of issues, um, COVID-19 and the Anthropocene, uh, and, and so we'll dive more into this later on. So I'm going to wait to answer more questions um, until we, we reach those lectures. Okay, and then another question. Um, in these animals of origin, the viruses tend to be pretty asymptomatic. Do we know of any viruses that humans can give to other animals that don't present symptoms in us? Absolutely. This is a big concern for people like me who study non-human primates because we can give non-human primates illnesses that are common in humans and they can be really detrimental to those species. Uh, so for example, where I work in Uganda a couple years ago, um, a, a respiratory illness that was circulating within humans basically your common cold, um, was transmitted to the wild chimpanzees that live in the forest where I work, and it caused an, a respiratory outbreak there, and several individuals died. It was a virus that does not cause death in humans, um, but because the chimpanzees had not come into contact with that virus before, it was very deadly to them. So it absolutely goes both ways, and we have to be thinking about it both ways. We'll talk about that more as well. There have been a lot of questions about vaccines and vaccine distribution. And I wanna just remind you that we will be talking about this for an entire lecture. Um, and we'll be talking to Dr. Phil Krauss from the FDA, who's responsible for vaccine development and distribution, who will be able to answer your questions about this um, extensively. 
I do think, though, that one thing I want people in this course to understand is that this is not an immediate fix. We are looking at a vaccine rollout that will take the better part of this year. And, you know, I, I keep reminding people of that because I think in terms of the mental health issues that we've been talking about, having a hopeful but realistic view of when we'll be able to start socializing a bit more and things like that um, is really important for our mental health. There have been studies that show that, you know, people who are super hopeful and then they never actually get those things they're hoping for, that can be really bad for mental health. But people who just are totally pessimistic and think nothing good is ever going to happen, that's also really bad for mental health. So it's this, this fine line that we're trying to skate between, um, between being hopeful and being realistic. So there is, there is hope. We have these amazing vaccines. They are being distributed. There is very much a possibility that we will be able to, to see each other and hug each other and everything else soon. But it is going to take time. That time has not happened yet. And so we need to be realistic about the fact that we just need to keep up these efforts that we have right now um, a bit longer until we can actually have that vaccine distribution. People also asked, is the vaccine distribution fair? I already commented on this. It, it isn't in many places. Um, and that's something we'll talk about more in this course as well. Uh, I think another question that was of interest to students is, how do you set boundaries with people who have different views on the safety regulations and, uh, you know, what they feel comfortable doing and whatnot? Um, and and related, a related question about kind of are pod safe or bubble safe, those sorts of things. So, you know, I think that in terms of setting boundaries, that's something that you have to do. Obviously, we have seen that in our country, we have not had uh, a very clear response from leadership about what we need to be doing. And so it's, you know, that's part of why within this course, we try and encourage creating that um, culture of being safe and doing things safely. But you have to set those boundaries, right? And that means, like I've said before, having these hard conversations, like really talking about what you feel comfortable with, what you're willing to do. So if you decide to get to, to get together to go for a walk outside um, or to sit in a backyard or something like that, you need to be very clear about, are we wearing masks when we show up? Are we wearing masks while we walk? How close are we going to sit to each other? Are we gonna take our masks off to have a drink? Something like that. Like you need to actually take the time to talk about these things. Are we gonna take off our masks and take a picture together, you know, with our faces pushed together? Those are things that you need to plan out in advance. And I get that that's not that fun. I get it, but this is the world we're in right now. Um, and I think having those conversations and planning things out is really important. I would also say that in terms of our pods safe, our bubbles safe, um, they certainly can be if they're actually being observed, right? And what the data have shown is that most of the bubbles or pods that exist are not truly exclusive. So people are um, you know, they're spending time with each other, but then they have like everybody within that pod actually has other people outside their pod that they spend time with. So you need to be extremely careful and have a lot of very frank conversations. And I would say one of the, the biggest um, pieces of advice I would give you is if someone says, quote, I'm being safe, do not believe them. That is almost entirely a meaningless phrase at this point. What being safe is means something different to everyone. So I, I, I don't care if someone tells me if they're being safe. I want to actually ask them like, so are you eating at restaurants? Are you spending time indoors with other people? You know, I want to ask them questions about what their actual behaviors are. And then I will decide if I consider that safe behavior or not in terms of whether I want to spend time with them or not, right? Um, in, in close contact. So, I mean, can pods work? Sure. I'm in a pod with my mother and my partner, right? My mom lives eight hours away. She's the only person that we have been unmasked around for, you know, I don't know, however long it's been. So we've spent time indoors, unmasked um, with her and her with us, and that's it. Like, we have only done that with each other. So, if you're very if you're very careful um, and you have clear guidelines, then it can work. 
but I just encourage communication. Communication is the key to basically everything. So you should be talking. Okay, this is another one. Everybody wants me to tell you if you should wear two masks or not. So uh, it totally depends on the mask. If you're wearing an N95 mask, please don't put two of them on. That's not how they work. Overall, with your mask wearing, what you want to be doing is making sure that you have a good fit, that you have a good mask. They are, they are saying that you should try and have three layers, right? So, you know, the part of the thing that is upsetting about the response to the pandemic in the United States is that we didn't actually use the time at the beginning to start um, a supply chain of the things that we need including good masks. And so as a result, we see, um, you know, people just wearing any kind of mask that they want. And that's a problem because not all masks work well. You want to make sure you have a tight fit around your nose all the way around your face. Um, you want to make sure that there are good, a good three layers um, between you and the outside world, right? But those should be breathable layers. I mean, they, they certainly shouldn't be like, uh, I don't know, plastic, because you won't be able to breathe, obviously. Um, so, you know, whether to wear two masks or not really depends on what kind of masks you're, you're wearing. But I would say this, if you have been just kind of floating by with, um, with masks, you know, washable masks, I, I'm all in favor of washable masks. I've worked, I've tried out a gazillion of them to find the ones that really fit me well um, and, and can be tightened and, and fit a way that I like. Some of them have pockets where I can insert uh, an, an additional layer of filter. Um, so there's nothing wrong with a reusable mask, provided that it's good, right? Provided that it actually creates a barrier and can filter out the particles that you need it to filter out. So I would say that if you have been getting by wearing whatever kind of mask you happen to find laying around or, you know, making masks out of your bed sheets and you don't really know the quality of those bed sheets or whatever, I would not advise that at this point. The new strains that are circulating definitely appear to be more um, transmissible than, than what we originally had. And I think that you want to make sure that you have a quality mask that works well. Um, and provided that you have that, uh, you don't necessarily need to wear two masks. But obviously, if the only way that you can get the number of layers that you need um, is to wear two masks, then you should do that. Uh, so that's that's as much as I can give you if you're, but again, if you're wearing an N95, you know, that's gonna be your best protection or a KN95. Um, and you definitely should not double those. I think that that would probably, I, I couldn't even imagine trying to wear two of those at once, but I would not recommend doing that. Okay, how should we try and feel sympathy? Oh, this question really was so good. How should we try and feel sympathy and not just disdain for those who have the privilege to wear masks slash social distance, but consciously choose not to do so? It's a great question. Um, and it's a really difficult one to answer. I think that something many people have been struggling with in this pandemic and will continue to struggle with after is how do you, how do you come to terms with the choices that other people were making that you feel very upset about. Um, and, you know, in terms of should you try and feel sympathy instead of disdain, I think you should, you should, uh, you, your feelings are valid. I'll say that your feelings are valid. And you should ask this question of Dr. Ennis when he comes to talk to us, uh, because hopefully he can help us all figure out how to do this. Um, but it is a very tough time and I don't want to minimize that because it really is. Uh, and, you know, part of what I try and remember is that not everyone has access to all of the same information that I have. And so I try and have patience in that way, um, but it's certainly difficult sometimes. Okay, there were some questions about environmental racism. This is just one of the examples of what was said about environmental racism. Um, does environmental racism, racism refer to how minorities live in neighborhoods with pollution, making them more likely to contract to have health conditions? And uh, yes, that's what it means. And thanks for asking and to the rest of you who asked questions like this. So I wanna go over environmental racism. Um, here is a figure from the uh, report called Environmental Racism in St. Louis. This report was produced by the um, 
the law school, WashU's law school, um, they have a, an environmental clinic, an, a clinic, environment clinic. Well, uh, yes. Anyway, they have a clinic at the law school that that produced this report. In addition to working with some um, community agencies, um, and they, it's got pages for every possible type of issue you could think of. But I just wanted to show you this image for air pollution. So here it's showing um, the darker the red. Uh, these are areas that are have a higher percent of minorities, minority people living in these darker red areas, right? So this is Forest Park. Here is basically, even though it's not labeled, Del Mar. Um, and so you can see that above there's there's more um, uh, like it's it's a lower income area and it's also an area where there are more um, minorities. These blue dots, those are um, air pollution sources. So factories, things like that. And the report says black St. Louisans are exposed to air pollutants from industries and power plants, vehicles and building demolitions. St. Louis has been in violation of the federal health based air standard for ozone since 1979 and violated the federal health based standards for fine particle pollution from 2005 through 2017. And they're showing here this overlap between areas um, here as well and then down in the south areas where it is more common for uh, um, Black community members to live, also being areas where we have these sources of air pollution. And one of the, you know, one of the, the reasons that this happens is because when they try and put some of these factories um, or other sources of air pollution in places that are wealthier or where more white people live, uh, there's obviously people that argue that they shouldn't be there, right? And so it's part of this, this institutional racism that exists where there's, there's, there ends up being these historical um, situations where we end up putting these less desirable plants or factories in neighborhoods where people do not have as much of a voice because of all of the history of how we have silenced them. Uh, so yeah, when you're thinking about air pollution in particular, we know that exposure to these air pollutants can then predispose you to the sorts of um, health, health issues that then also make you more likely to suffer from COVID-19. So these are all very overlapping. Um, all right, so last question for today. Somebody asked about my dog, which I'm super jazzed about because I love my dog. So I'll just introduce you to Anvilhead. This is her, she's super sweet. She's a Puerto Rican street dog that I met when I was studying monkeys um, in Puerto Rico. And uh, she sometimes accidentally barks when we're in class and things like that. And I try to use her as a model for good behavior whenever I have a chance. So thanks for asking about my dog. That is Anvil Head. Okay, so I wanna point out, and I know I said this before, but there have been a lot of questions about things that we're gonna be talking about throughout this whole semester. So I can't answer everything up front. Um, keep in mind that we'll work through these different topics as we go along. Uh, so, you know, you'll have the chance to ask questions when we're covering that topic for a day. I also wanna point out um, that you should please, please, please pay attention. Sometimes I will spend three slides explaining a certain point. Um, and then later someone will ask a question about the exact same thing that I already explained. And that obviously doesn't make it seem like there's a lot of engagement in what's going on in the course um, and instead just asking questions to ask questions. So we're not here to just get a bunch of questions uh, that aren't focused on, on what's actually being covered, but instead hoping that we can help you to engage in the class by answering questions that, you ha that you've had. I also wanna point out that next week we will open our next discussion board if you would like to participate in it. We're gonna be sharing some, some ideas for how to help our mental health and fight the feelings of isolation during the pandemic. So I hope that this is something that we can all share how we've been handling it, any tips and whatnot, um, and, and help each other to get through. Okay. I've, I've covered a lot of information about issues related to health 
in terms of COVID-19. I also want to talk a little bit about the economy. Okay. So we had a lecture by Pauline Kim from WashU's Law School um, last year, and she showed this figure that um, indicates what happened in March in terms of unemployment. And what you will see here is that there is this sharp increase in unemployment for all three of these lines. Now, let me tell you that these lines include white down here, um, Hispanic and Latino up here, and Black or African American here, okay? So what you'll see here is that there was a large increase in unemployment as a result of the pandemic, and others have written about this issue. Um, and, and so this increase in, uh, in unemployment related to the pandemic has been a huge concern, right? So even beyond people getting sick, we have to worry about them having income. You'll notice here from this picture that, first of all, for Hispanic or Latino and Black or African American, the, the unemployment rate went higher for those groups than it did for uh, white Americans. In addition to it going higher, it also stayed high longer. So you start to see this recovery to some extent um, for white Americans, but, but you don't see as much recovery um, for uh, Latino and Black. In particular, Black Americans kind of plateau out here. Um, so that's certainly a concern. So in part, in, in Professor Kim's talk, she laid out some of the inequalities um, in, in how different demographics within our population have um, been impacted by the pandemic. So even beyond health, I mean, I think at this point, hopefully I've given you enough information to understand that there are all sorts of uh, racial disparities related to health outcomes um, and COVID-19. But it is not just that, also in terms of workers' rights. So in our country, in the United States, there is no requirement for paid sick leave. That is not something that we have a federal mandate on. And there are very limited options for family leave. So this became a huge issue because what it meant was that for people that were in less privileged occupations, um, they didn't have the ability to take off time and still get paid if they uh, you know, thought that they had an exposure or if someone in their house was sick or if um, they were sick. So you can imagine that we didn't create very good circumstances to reduce the, the transmission of COVID-19 when we weren't even allowing people to safely stay home and not worry about not having any money. So uh, Professor Kim shared some information about even before the pandemic, what labor, the labor pool looked like in the United States. Um, and this information comes from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. Black and Latino workers are less likely to have paid sick leave and or to be able to work from home. So all of a sudden, not only do we have these disparities in having a more privileged or not position, have being a low wage worker um, or not, but then layered into that is the fact that black and Latino workers are more likely to be in those positions where they don't have paid sick leave and where they're in their, these low wage jobs. So you may remember that in response to this, the government issued some additional funds to try and help everyone in this pandemic. And the first act um, that I'll talk about, there are two that I'm gonna talk about, is called Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Uh, and this act, said that employers, okay, so what you would have heard about it is that employers must provide two weeks of paid sick leave for COVID related issues. In reality, of course, like with all laws, there were, um, or acts, there were certain stipulations. So in fact, there were, there were certain categories that this fit into, right? And it was meant to, it was meant to try and uh, encapsulate ev everyone that would need help 
but certainly there ended up being loopholes in this. Um, and so it provided people with two weeks of paid sick leave, but you can imagine for a virus that can have an incubation period of two weeks and then you get sick, or that can cause these long-term, what they're calling long hauler or long COVID illness, um, two weeks is not really enough. In addition to that, if you're part of a family that ends up having you know, transmission within your family, so your child gets it, you're caring for your child for two weeks, then you get it, so you're sick for two weeks, then your partner gets it, and so on and so forth, um, two weeks suddenly isn't really that much time for the sort of illness that we're talking about. So again, if for people who were in positions that already had the option of taking paid sick leave or working from home, this was less of a stressor, but for people who needed this Family First Coronavirus Response Act to be able to take any time off, in actuality, it didn't really give them enough to, to be able to, to be safe in all of their actions, right? Because for example, if you knew you had an exposure, um, you may not feel comfortable taking two weeks off if you know that you might need those two weeks for when you actually get sick. So, you know, it's a, it's, we were asking people to make decisions that they shouldn't have needed to make. Okay, and then you would have also heard about the CARES Act. The CARES Act expanded unemployment benefits. And so in other words, you saw that huge increase in people who lost their jobs. So the CARES Act, um, first of all, well, it did a couple things. One is that it gave extra money to people who were unemployed to try and offset um, the, the issues associated with that. The other thing it did is expanded to what's commonly referred to as gig workers. So people that are considered self-employed, people who work for Uber or Lyft or um, food delivery services. I obviously don't use enough food delivery services because I don't know any of the names. Uh, in any event, people who work for those, those types of um, in work in those types of jobs, they're actually considered like self-employed. And so they don't have they don't have unemployment benefits, but under the CARES Act, it was expanded to include them. Now, both of these, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act and the CARES Act were a limited time. Um, and as I'm sure you are aware, there ended up being a lot of arguments over um, uh, expanding these or, or doing another iteration of these later in the year. And then again, now, now that it's a new year. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the issues around this are really complicated. One of them being that um, in some of the packages that were proposed in order to give additional stimulus checks, for example, and uh, to expand the paid sick leave and whatnot, there were additional um, rules attached that included things like protecting big poultry producers, from being sued by workers who got sick while they were increasing the workload during COVID-19. So, you know, when you hear about some of these things in the news, for example, um, it sounds like, well, why didn't everybody just pass that one where they were gonna give us a stimulus check? And it's because in doing so, it would have been at the cost of the people who had continued to be working in those food service jobs um, and then ended up getting injured or sick because of it, they would not have been protected. So there were these, trade-offs that, that were being argued. I'm hopeful that uh, soon we will have a better, a better package that's good for everyone and not just trading off one person's safety for another. But I did want to explain um, that that's why you may have heard about some, you know, things that seemed like it should be really obvious um, and then end up not being, um, not going through the way you thought it would. Uh, okay, so Professor Kim showed some pictures. Um, I mentioned before the poultry industry and how you know that was a, a particular industry that led to a lot of COVID-19 transmissions. Um, she so showed us some pictures kind of, of what the working conditions are. So you can see here, for example, people are standing very close together, long hours, um, lots of people in a small space, very close together. And, and then because there was this emphasis on increasing supply and making sure there wasn't a national food shortage, 
uh, you had people working, you know, and not being able to take time off. And even for example, some companies doing things like um, giving bonuses if nobody missed a single day. So people who maybe would have uh, benefited from staying home or their communities would have benefited from the, them staying home, um, didn't end up staying home because they, they didn't wanna lose that opportunity for some um, additional income when you're talking about hourly low paid workers, right? That makes, that makes perfect sense. Um, so I, I wanna go back to this and just talk a little bit about an idea that I think has been, has been circulating, especially in relation to how we're dealing with workers' rights and COVID-19 but is an, is an idea that people have also just been talking about for a long time, and that's disposability. I think that um, we, I, I think that many people just take for granted that we consider some people in our society disposable. And so, for example, we needed an increase in food production during COVID-19. Uh, so, you know, the people who work in those industries, they just needed to do it. And what came of them came of them, right? And that's, that's, that is a way of viewing people as disposable. And you'll, 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 ref, you'll see that idea kind of, even though people don't call it that necessarily when you, when you think about war and stuff like that, um, there's different ways in which you can identify like, oh, okay, those people were apparently disposable. And I think that we do, you know, it's, it's kind of horrifying when you put it that way, like we're making decisions about who's, who's disposable. And I think we need to talk about that more. So I had mentioned the book, We Still Hear um, by Mark Lamont Hill. And there's a, a sentence in it that I think relates to this really well in terms of thinking about COVID-19. And, and he has this chapter called Corona Capitalism. And it talks a lot about these same types of issues that um, Professor Kim was talking about in terms of what acts were passed to try and help people who they actually helped because we now know that there were a lot of loopholes that allowed really wealthy businesses to benefit from the um, from those loopholes. I mean, uh, one of the examples that became kind of famous was that Shake Shack got $10 million in aid, uh, even though it was actually doing fine. And then people really spoke out against that. Um, in the media and social social media, and then they kind of were forced to give back that money. But you know, of course, there were plenty of of businesses that um, that took advantage. You know, there were businesses that were doing better than ever during uh, the stay at home orders, and and then ended up being able to take advantage of this money that was supposed to be helping out people who really needed it. So, um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, the the chapter Corona Capitalism in this book we still hear by Mark Lamont Hill, which I referenced previously um, is, is good for learning more about that sort of stuff. Uh, and so this sentence says, your disposability makes you more exploitable. And I think that's definitely what we're seeing in this picture, right? If we consider people disposable, then we are more willing to exploit them. And I, I've heard this, this concept talked about also um, among indigenous scholars who talk about how um, when colonizers came, that's, that's when this idea of people being disposable was introduced. Um, and I think that's really, I don't know, that has left a big impression on me in terms of thinking about the way we're acting within this, within this pandemic. And I hope maybe that also gives you all some insight to kind of think about some of these questions that we're discussing. Um, Okay, so many people say like, okay, fine, but we had to make a trade-off between our health or our economy, right? So early on, especially, there were people who were like, look, we can't protect our health because we have to be worried about our economy. And, and one of the ways that this really came up was with lockdowns. People were concerned about lockdowns because it would hurt the economy even if it helped us in terms of health. There has been a lot written about this in the time since the original lockdowns. Um, and you know, importantly, the United States never went into lockdown, right? It was all up to individual cities and, and states of whether they were going to have any kind of lockdown. But across the globe, people were enforcing lockdowns. And so there's been a lot written about that 
And, and I, economists are basically all um, in agreement that the lockdowns are not the concern for the economy. The virus is the concern for the economy. And many people have written about this. So this is an example um, that Dr. Shin from the economics department at WashU shared with us, looking at uh, early on the lockdowns, um, or sorry, early on the, the number of deaths attributed to COVID-19 in different countries. So um, up here, the one that I want you to pay attention to is Sweden. So Sweden and the United States are, are up here together. This is the, um, so th this is a log scale. So it's maybe a little bit hard to understand, but I just want you to look at the differences in distance of these endpoints. So South Korea is down here. Here's Norway and Denmark. So Norway and Denmark being close neighbors of Sweden. Um, and then Sweden up here with the United States. So what you're gonna see from this is that Sweden had a lot more deaths than its neighbors of Denmark, Denmark and Norway. And one of the reasons for this you may recall is that Sweden took a very strong stance against lockdowns and they decided they were going for herd immunity. And so they decided not to change anything. They didn't, they didn't have people wear masks. They didn't have lockdowns. Um, they just let everyone continue about the way they normally would. And they decided that was how they were going to handle the pandemic. And, and their hypothesis was that in doing that, their economy would be stronger and they would be better in the long run. Okay, so down here are numbers uh, that Dr. Shin had provided for us in terms of growth forecast for these different countries um, and also unemployment rates. So Sweden had a lot of deaths. It also did not fare much better in terms of economic growth uh, or lack of economic growth, I guess we could say. And it also didn't fare much better in terms of unemployment rate compared to its neighbors. So it took the hit of having a lot of deaths in the country. And then it had the added, um, well, I guess it didn't pay off in that there wasn't this great economic payout. And what Dr. Shin talked about and what other economists have talked about is that uh, the virus itself is what is impacting the economy. It doesn't matter whether you have lockdowns or not. If you have an uncontrolled virus running through your country or through the world, it is going to change people's behaviors. It is going to impact the economy. It is going to have an effect on workers and uh, clients and um, you know, businesses and the people that those businesses serve. And then the longer the virus outbreak lasts in a country, the worse the impacts will be on the economy and the people in that country, right? So, I mean, there is no doubt that lockdowns have negative consequences, particularly for uh, poor people or people living in poverty who, uh, you know, who live in countries that don't provide for them, that don't have social services. There's no doubt that, it, that lockdowns are really hard on them. And so are deadly uh, viral outbreaks. So, you know, those people are always going to be the most impacted, but how long that impact lasts and how bad it is um, depends on, on whether you can get that virus under control or not. Without mitigation tactics, there are negative impacts on both health and the economy. So it's not a, you have to, you have to prioritize economy over health they're actually intimately linked and by deciding to not care about people's health or the number of people that die, you actually are doing more damage in the long run to the economy. Okay, so uh, that is what I was going to talk about in terms of answering previous questions and also um, talking about the economy and workers' rights. I did also want to just point out in terms of what I was just talking about with, um, you know, thinking about how these things are always harder on people living in poverty, um, but also how that it has an effect on all of us. Uh, last time I had mentioned this book, A Terrible Thing to Waste, Environmental Racism and Its Assault on the American Mind by Harriet Washington. And since several of you asked me about environmental 
racism, I wanted to once again point out that you may want to check out that book. It, um, the name of both of these books and the authors are in the PowerPoint slides from last time. There were no PowerPoint slides this time because I've, I haven't provided you any new figures, um, just pictures to go along with what I've been saying. But um, in this book, you know, I mentioned that there's a new preface that talks about COVID-19. And the way that that chapter ends, um, she says, all Americans must keep in mind that whether we are discussing cognitive disorders or coronavirus, Native Americans, African Americans, Latinos, and other marginalized populations are the canaries in the coal mine whose medical fates serve as early detection of generalized disaster. And then she goes on to say, in this way, the polluted environments of racial enclaves in the United States pose a hazard to the wider nation as well, thanks to our medical interdependence. So these even if you just don't care at all about other people, which hopefully you do, um, you know, these are things that ultimately will impact you as well. So it's important to keep that um, in mind. Environmental racism and racism overall is, is uh, has negative impacts on our entire society. Okay, so 